Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for coming here this afternoon. Uh, we are delighted that uh, Tanya Zak is here uh, in India and was here for a conference in Chennai, and we, we've been lucky to uh, get her to come across to Delhi. Uh, Dr. Zak uh, is an urban planner, writer, and reflective practitioner, as you've seen. Uh, she uh, um, straddles the space of uh, planning practice, policy, academia, and creative writing. Uh, she's got a PhD from the Witzwaterrand University in Johannesburg uh, and has been living and working in Johannesburg and studying Johannesburg for at least two, uh, 25 years. More recently, uh, her 10 photo books on Wake Up, This is Joburg has got a lot of attention and uh, uh, where she, uh, and she's currently researching on the Ethiopian quarter, or so-called Ethiopian quarter, as she says, in in a city, Johannesburg. Uh, uh, we've uh, we uh, we've kind of uh, agreed for her to do this talk, which is one of her many talks on Joburg, uh, which is on making do in a crowded city, infrastructure facing up to in migration in Johann Joburg's inner city. Uh, Tanya, you'll have 45 minutes and then uh, a half an hour, 40 minutes for questions. Thank you Thank very you much. so much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. You'd see conspicuous by its absence are the words water and sanitation in um, Shubagatu's introduction of me. So my apologies around that, but I will be talking about migration and infrastructure and really how the poor in the inner city of Johannesburg, including migrants, uh, make do around stressed infrastructure. But before I begin, if I could um, just, just read to you an, an excerpt from a paper that I'm working on. Three men walk out of the building known as Standby, its local naming capturing reams of academic texts about transience and waiting in the city where claims to shelter and infrastructure are contested and are tentative. Each man is carrying a few buckets, performing the socially organized water distribution that has replaced the municipal service in the standby building. One man leans into the open manhole cover on the sidewalk and levers a valve. The municipal stormwater that gushes from this is a life force for occupants of this building where electrical wiring and plumbing fittings have long been stripped out for resale and where if any rentals are collected, they are not servicing the municipal account. Even where the state's reach is truncated, water is not to be taken for granted in the city. In this case, the informal economy may well extract a payment for servicing the artificial water scarcity in many buildings where infrastructure is no longer hidden in walls and floors, but is delivered by hand in buckets. Um, and so it would be interesting for me if we could maybe talk about socially transacted water distribution, um, which I imagine you know a great deal more about. So Johannesburg's CBD was developed as a high-rise modernist centre in the 20th century. Then it catered to commerce and to a white residential population. It has since undergone decline and some re revitalisation, but that revitalisation has mainly focused on middle income and low middle income rental units. The inner city has become an entry point and a place of opportunity for many, including the poor. It continues to be a meeting point for diverse cultures as scores of individuals aspire to create a livelihood and to find a foothold in the heart of Johannesburg. But the need to deliver opportunities for shelter for the poor in the inner city has largely been neglected by the state. Johannesburg's inner city has hosted internal and international migrants for all of its existence, and it's well steeped in transience even when it specifically housed white people in the middle of the last century and when it excluded black people from living there with tenure, the inner city hosted migrants. In that case, European migrants, both from Europe and from colonies that were fast achieving independence in southern Africa. Political upheaval, suburbanization of business, as Johannesburg follows American trends in its, in its planning, and poor planning policies in the CBD stimulated a massive property decline from about the 1970s. And, and right up until the early 2000s, when that decline helped pave the way for poorer households who were fleeing overcrowded conditions in surrounding black townships 
as well as new local and foreign in-migrants to find accommodation in a city. In some cases, new migrants carved out not only living space, but also a livelihood in the area. Since the 1990s, the inner city has been transformed, not only by the forces that challenge apartheid geography, but also by risk-taking and expediency of private developers, of landlords, of migrant populations, and of globalization. It is a host city where a liberal immigration policy shares a platform with coercive and contradictory policy, and where high levels of poverty are present. In this context, legal and undocumented migrants and asylum seekers employ individual and often innovative practices in their search for shelter and for livelihood creation. So Johannesburg has, the city centre has a modernist infrastructure. It is an infrastructure that was built to last and that is highly flexible. Buildings and spaces in many parts of the inner city have been informalised and appropriated and revalued for uses and for densities that exceed the limits of the official plans and policies. These are the spaces where people are making do for themselves and where they are claiming a right to the city and to its infrastructures. Sometimes these ways of living and of making a living are survivalist. It is a place where life for displaced persons happens under extreme and hazardous circumstances and where survival is hustled and carved from inadequate, stressed infrastructure. I'd like to pause and say, other than a couple of the lousy photographs, all the photographs within this presentation um, are from the, the photographer Mark Lewis. Often appropriation and reconfiguration of infrastructure is entrepreneurial, and it results in places where innovation and learning emerge, because in-migrants extract from the city, exploit its infrastructure, but they also adapt it in ways that lay the foundation for a new city form. The available data, the census 2001 and our 2011 census, indicate a total population growth of some 23% in the inner city over those 10 years, compared to the national population growth rate of 16%. While households have grown by 6% in the same period, the projections for infrastructure demand indicate it would take over 20 years to catch up with the backlogs in basic services across Johannesburg. In addition, housing delivery has not kept pace with the natural growth and urbanization. And so this is a city where apartment blocks that were designed to accommodate young couples and starter families in spacious flats now accommodate several households or many single people in each room. From her bed, in a small hillbrow apartment, Bertha Galeka runs an NGO in the shelter. Her tenants all share her one-bedroom space, sleeping and living on a large raft of beds. At any one time, there are up to 34 residents. Tenants can come and go, and they pay 200 rand a month if they can afford it. How do they navigate the basic infrastructure and the lack of privacy in this space? Sometimes we ladies go wash at the public bathhouse across the road. There you can wash your whole body. But not here, says Nonchantla Jojo, as she fills a kettle from a large plastic drum. Those who need to leave early for work or for job hunting go first, says Jojo. Some wake at 3 a.m., wash and then go back to bed. In the bathroom there is no water flowing from the taps. The blackened bath is not used for washing. Its reservoir of brown water is bucketed out for flushing the toilet in the adjacent cubicle. When she emerges from the bathroom, Jojo explains, you have to hide yourself to dress. We ladies hold a sheet for each other. She opens her suitcase and places it and her clothing, her mirror and her toiletries on one corner of the bed she shares with four women. She's from Lusikisiki in the Eastern Cape. She trained as a healthcare worker, and when she could not find work, a friend told her about Berthel. In Joburg, she worked whatever jobs she could, as a street sweeper, a data capturer, a volunteer in a surgical ward, and a night nanny. The problem is unemployment, says Berthel. Even with grade 12, you can't find work. But if you are homeless, it is absolutely impossible. My plan is to give accommodation. With that stability, they can find work. As they navigate the labyrinth of everyday routines in the congested flat, the disparate job seekers are bound by the same concerns. Have you tried, is what they ask. And it opens another infrastructure question. Have you typed your CV, improved your CV, prepared for interviews, enlisted for piecework, applied for courses, volunteered? 
It all requires internet access, Jojo says. The clerks at the internet cafe charge us 10 rand a page to type our CVs. I have an account there, but I don't have the money. So now I can't check if someone has responded to my email applications. Internet is a luxury beyond the possibility of this flat, even where the most basic services are, improvi are improvised. The water source is a red fire hose that snakes into the building from the drain on the sidewalk. Each day it is fed through the kitchen window to fill 20 litre containers. The electrical distribution board spews wire spaghetti. Mobile phones hang like barnacles from multiple adapter plugs on a corner bed. In this and other ways, housing is being supplied to the poor by the poor. It is provided informally and through the repurposing of residential and of other spaces. It is catering to household configurations that range from singles to couples to families or to groups, sharing with people they know or to strangers living together. These are new community formations of people who may well not want to stay permanently in inner city Johannesburg. Whether they come from surrounding townships, from small towns, from rural areas, or from countries across the borders of South Africa, they are in the inner city to access opportunity for employment or to access services. These and far more extreme living conditions are not are not the only circumstances of the 30,000 households whose monthly income does not qualify them for formally provided accommodation in the inner city. Many live in places that would not pass the city's bylaws, but that are safe, are clean, and are well managed. Rented spaces range from whole flats to rent, to whole flat to rent, to rooms, to shared rooms, to balcony spaces, beds and beds to share. In a random dipstick survey of 150 people living in less formal accommodation in the inner city, we found that the market is sensitive, it is intelligent, and it is responsive. Subletting of space is common, and extremely limited space is rented out at significant costs. A doorway space or a simple bed space is the most limited accommodation available. It rents at a minimum of 500 rand per month. A large shared room may cost 3,500 rand per month. Cross-border migrants form a large portion of the low-cost housing market. The formalized system checks and rules related to asylum seekers whose home affairs papers have to be renewed every few months and thus provide them no security because migrants cannot sign tenant leases with such short-term security on their home affairs papers. They are therefore excluded from, afford from accessing affordable accommodation and they, defend they depend on the informal market. Johannesburg is a place to make a living, a place where you can hustle a living with a few belts over your arm. But competition within the informal economy is tight, and success often depends on a reading of and a responses to the market. This may involve a sort of specialised tailoring to customer needs, as was witnessed in the taxi binding point under the Moy Street Bridge. Here, entrepreneurs cater to the needs of drivers, offering barber services or selling food and snacks socks, window wipers, mobile phone attachments, and bumper stickers, with me bumper stickers with messages such as, you also drive like shit, so fuck off. Several food stalls compete for the appetites of the 600 drivers who wait here between the morning and the afternoon peak hours. Others offer motor mechanic services. There are hawkers who sell plastic water bottles, boilers. These are so necessary in a city where access to hot water for cooking or washing can be tight as marginalization extends to exclusion from municipal services. People line up with their buckets, their tins and even wheeled garbage bins to scoop the apparently free water that is gushing from the municipal stormwater pipe that has been intercepted at the taxi point. It is a life source for all the car washers and the cooking stalls here, as there is no running water under this bridge. <coughs> Similar stormwater outlets are also a source of water for people living in overcrowded, unserviced buildings in the inner city that has yet to adequately confront its role as an arrival city and a city for the poor. Economic marginalization is pronounced in Johannesburg and the most menial labor, a service that is totally unpaid and where income is gained only from the sale of rubbish, is undertaken by brigades of waste reclaimers who recycle who collect recyclable plastic, paper, metal and glass without wages, 
without labour protection, health insurance or union representation. They collect waste from different parts of the city, sometimes walking over 30 kilometres a day. No safe lanes, no water points, no rest points or storage are provided for these productive workers. The daily routines of reclaimers is arduous. Lucas and Gwenya, Given Matatiel and Livingston Secunda have lined up. It is 6am and the temperature is 4 degrees as the men begin their second trip to the recycling depot in Newtown. It is a 5 kilometre journey, but it will take them over 2.5 hours to drag their gargantuan loads over the top of the Witwatersrand. runt. Lucas seemingly has the lightest burden. He has a double, tr he's a double, a double trolley, whereas the others have three articulated trolleys. But Lucas points out that the cardboard that occupies more than twice the capacity of the blue plastic quilted bag it is loaded into and on top of will weigh in at over 150 kilograms, and the plastic bottles and white paper will bring his load to 265 kilograms. His body mass is 61 kilograms. The living circumstances of reclaimers living in the inner city are illustrated in the following extract. Only weeks before their son Kotso is born, Naleli and Lebo are evicted from a building in Dornfontein. Two blocks away, they find a two-metre square makeshift room that will curiously be called a flat in the Supreme Court of Appeals judgment in the matter between the city and the landlords and the unlawful occupiers of this building. Their flat is one of nearly a hundred living spaces in this warehouse. The city's legal council will speak of a building not suited to human habitation. He will mention the lack of toilet facilities and water, and that electricity is sourced from illegal connections. He will note that refuse and human waste litter the public spaces. The court application will not detail the neat interior of the room that this family inhabits, or the relationships that allow Nalele to return to work a couple of months after the baby is born, because the lady down the passage will take care of her child. Johannesburg's inner city is a place where leftover land and redundant buildings are appropriated for income generation. That space may be threatened or criminalized by the authorities, but it provides opportunity for new entrants to the saturated informal economy of the city. Places where informal butchers chop cow heads in disused buildings, within view of banking head offices in the shadow of the city's railway station, and against the city's premier art sculpture, the Firewalker. Whereas the real firewalkers of our city hide their braziers and equipment because, of, because their trade of selling millies from an open fire, which is as old as the city itself, is illegal. Of this trade of selling millies and of, and on, on fire and of carrying that fire literally on, people, on their heads, as the, fire, as the firewalkers do, William Kentridge, the creator of the firewalker sculpture, spoke of a harsh city in which it is in which sit women have to carry fire on their heads in order to make a living. But it is also a city, he said, where if we can carry fire on our heads, we can do anything. Johannesburg is an uneven place which hosts extreme need alongside surplus. It is also a place where many migrant entrepreneurs find their fortunes within the city's excess infrastructure. Ongoing research, price comparison, attention to displays, quantity and variety mark the work of traders in the Rocky Street Market in Yeovil, a building that was rejected by local traders in the late 1990s when the city wanted to mop them off the streets and locate them into a formal market. But the market was soon seized by migrant traders and now it stocks food and oils that are unfamiliar to native Joburgers, but as familiar as their own tongue to those who have crossed half a continent to be here. There are varieties of beans from Malawi and the DRC, palm oil from Ghana and Cameroon, spices from Nigeria, Mapani worms and dried fish from Zambia, and face creams and antiseptic lotions from the DRC, Cote d'Ivoire, and France. It is an Afropolitan trader population that includes barbers from Nigeria, dressmakers and fabric sellers from Nigeria, South Africa, and the DRC, tailors and cobblers from Ghana and from Nigeria, photographers from the DRC and Mozambique, vegetable sellers from Zimbabwe and Mozambique. This is a place where your cell phone can be your shop. Geraldine is Zambian. Her imports of beans, peanuts, cassava, dried fish, eggplant and okra are sought after in Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban and East London. 
She sources her goods for regular customers and she brings in what is in, what is in short supply. <coughs> Geraldine has no shop, no storage space, no distribution centre. Her shop is her cell phone. She now stocks from Nigeria, Cameroon, Malawi, Tanzania, Ghana, Mozambique and Zambia. This is low-end globalisation and the trading lattice is organised by word of mouth and by transactions that are recorded on scraps of paper or in notebooks. Elsewhere, Johannesburg's inner city is being transformed as migrants carve a livelihood into buildings that have outlived their usefulness as office towers. Medical suites in high-rise towers of Jeppe Street, which was once the Harley Street of Johannesburg, have been repurposed into thousands of cubicle-sized shops serving a trade that stretches through Africa. How do you unfold a one square meter shop? First, unlock and roll up the metal shutter door to reveal overflowing boxes pressed up to the ceiling. It will take you 45 minutes to unpack the boxes and display the goods. You will use every centimeter of the 16 shelves inside the tiny shop, and you will appropriate the six narrow shelves on either side of your shop entrance that extend your frontage to almost three meters. Your niche is small, so your niche is small items that you can fit, and you can fit a surprising array and number of goods within arm's length. Shoe polish, face cloth, dish towels, underpants, stockings, nail polish, strawberry, grape and cherry lip gloss, eyeliner, and smoker's toothpaste. As you unpack this item, Bertha says, it doesn't work, <coughs> China, China. Some items such as razors, band-aid, and locks can be suspended from the nails that are inserted into the front of shelves. As she unpacks the skin lightening cream, Bertha will indicate that you must put those on the back shelf because the police grab it. I'm not allowed to sell it. Bertha is one of thousands of Ethiopian shopkeepers who have joined the wave of migration to Johannesburg's inner city, driven by a combination of opportunity and dire political and economic circumstance. Many have set up small and informal retail outlets in Jeppe. Most of this activity operates below the radar and without the support of formal financial, taxation and trading administrations. Much of this globalization from below operates in the gaps of a lack of enforcement of labor laws, copyright laws and restrictions. Without this gap and without the extraordinary spaces that harbor the distribution points of cheap and often pirated Chinese goods, citizens of Africa might be excluded from this globalization. It is a booming economy that has transformed space and pioneered a retail phenomenon in the inner city for the sale of cheap clothing, shoes, household wares, and accessories. On the map above, we mapped the dominant goods in each of 3,000 shops that we counted within a small area of 53 city blocks in the inner city. But this cash economy, its logistics, and its services are not yet factored into city economic development strategies, and mostly, it's thought of within the city discourse of decline and decay. It occurs on city blocks that the municipality does not define as even part of its retail core. The shopping district now comprises more than 16 full city blocks and more than 3,000 tiny shops that have been created through the unregulated subdivision of space that was originally medical suites. It is an area known as Jeppe. It is a place where China meets Africa. Because seven days a week, thousands of consumers come from surrounding townships, from rural South Africa, and from sub-Saharan Africa. They arrive by rail and by taxi to shop for Chinese clothing, homeware, and groceries in Jeppe. The extent of, the shopping, of this cross-border shopping hub is significant. These shops, located in a relatively small part of Johannesburg, service this trade in a zone that is not pre-planned or driven by pension funds or any, any large single investors, but is created one micro shop at a time by the collective energy of multiple investors and would-be entrepreneurs. The high demand for floor space has pushed rentals up and has squeezed shop sizes to a minimum. Cubicle shops that occupy no more than two square meters are rented out at amounts of over 400 rand per square meter. Compared with a rental in the rest of the, of the body of the city, in the city that is under 180 rand per square meter. Trading is symbiotic. Hawkers often rely on nearby shops for their stock, and the sharing of 
and share the costs of private security in this crime-ridden area. Retailers report that their greatest threat comes not from ordinary criminals, but from the city's metropolitan police force. Almost daily, police officers enter shops and confiscate counterfeit goods, only to return a while later and offer those goods for sale at a cost of many thousands of rands to the same or an alternative shopkeeper. These are occurrences, which is why, when the traders in Jeppe were taken, which is why the traders in Jeppe were taken by surprise in 2013, when several police forces descended in a massive raid on this area. Within a few days, every street trader stall in Jeppe was removed and multiple shops were, shops were closed. This was Operation Clean Sweep. It is a manifestation of a city of Johannesburg that is at odds with itself, where public policies speak of employment creation, of poverty alleviation, and of inclusivity, but where the conscious, brutal act of removing street traders appears to emanate from a compulsion to clean the city of undesirable elements. It is about equating what the city cannot regulate with dirt, with crime, and with threat. The failure to attend to this area of burgeoning economic activity in a city whose economy is straining is a hopeless miscalculation. In this recent study that I oversaw, which focuses on cross-border shopping, we mapped the shops and the goods that are sold. We also conducted detailed interviews of 300 retailers and 400 cross-border shoppers, as well as hotel managers and bus operators that service the flow of shoppers who travel to Johannesburg. The sample survey indicates that some 70% of the shoppers contributing to profits in this area are cross-border shoppers. Each is spending an average of 14,364 Rand on goods per shopping trip, and they come monthly. In addition, they spend about 3,500 Rand on all other services, including transport and accommodation. Their contribution to turnover is vast. Informal estimates place the annual turnover attributable only to cross-border shoppers in the inner city of Johannesburg at over 10 billion. By comparison, that amounts to twice the annual turnover of Africa's largest shopping mall, the Santon City Shopping Centre, which is located in the financial heart of Johannesburg, some 15 kilometres from the inner city. A large number of bus companies services this trade. On one day, we counted 51 bus companies operating from 19 sites, many of them informal sites and possibly under the, in the eye of the city for removal of the municipality. But retailers and shoppers face enormous risks in the inner city. Their dependence on cash poses a big risk in this area where crime and corruption is rife. There are many anecdotal reports of corruption. The law enforcement agencies involved in this include the police and the Metropolitan Police, as well as tax authorities. Over 60% of retailers interviewed had been physically attacked or assaulted in the inner city, and 38% had regularly gifted police officers. For shoppers, the risk is extreme. A third of shoppers interviewed had been exposed to violent crime in Johannesburg. They travel in groups, they hide their money. They depend heavily on the security and the storage facilities of the hotels and the bus depots located within this shopping precinct for their safety. Johannesburg is not maximizing its benefit from these shopping trips. Shoppers, who are on average in the inner city for only two and a half days, spend comparatively little on accommodation and almost nothing on entertainment. Right now, they are too fearful to spend more time in Johannesburg than their shopping requires. Most say they don't even eat in city restaurants. They prefer to lock themselves in their hotel rooms early in the evening. But these people using their bodies and using their mobile phones are the distribution network of goods from China to sub-Saharan Africa via Johannesburg. They make Johannesburg an international port. Retailers also say they would like to extend their shopping hours, but they close their shops at 5 p.m. because of safety concerns. What does the city do? The pedestrian environment is the platform from which all cross-border retail activity takes place, but broken paving, fallen street lights, large pools of stormwater and vast amounts of litter confront these international shoppers in the city streets. Cross-border shoppers are international visitors to Johannesburg. Their visits to the city increase the demand for services, for products and for good infrastructure, 
These are all economic imperatives that attract jobs and investment in the inner city. They require and they inspire new investment in buildings, maintenance, entertainment services, transport services and accommodation establishments. They transform buildings and environments in the inner city, and they attract and support new cultural enclaves and diversity. Each shop is on average creating three jobs. That's 9,000 jobs just in the survey that we did, in, in the area of that survey. This activity is economically enabling. It is also extractive. Congestion levels are high. Many buildings are at increasing risk of dereliction of, and safety hazards abound. These risks may contribute to a downward spiral in this oversubscribed microeconomy. Or the immense opportunity may push traders and investors towards greater formalization and a sense of ownership of the built environment. The extent of the shopping hub is significant. Within it, a transformative informal encroachment and appropriation of the built form has been instrumental in shaping and reshaping a unique shopping district. It is innovative and it has imagined and produced new forms of trade space that are leading an unrecognized urban transformation in Johannesburg. Now these registers of informality have been picked up by the private sector and are being mimicked in new formal sector shopping centers. They may even be leading to regeneration in this part of town. This matters because it is evidence of a migrant collective peopled by entrepreneurs with little legality and little status in Johannesburg and hosted in an architecture that is dynamic, is informal and fluid, but they are playing in the big league. It is not an appropriation of space by an underclass at the periphery of a city or of an economy. It is a booming enterprise in goods and property that is front and center of city transformation in Johannesburg. It is time to roll out the red carpet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanya. That was, I mean, a very graphic exp uh, exposition to the inner city and, uh, and uh, migration and um, uh, the shopping uh, economy around there. Um, I, I, in my experience, Joburg is very unique in the sense that the kind of building form that uh, that uh, that is generating this kind of economy, and in its not so recent, I mean, not uh, not so much in the past, uh, was uh, was meant for so many different uses, is uh, means quite rare in my uh, understanding. But I I like to open it out, and uh, maybe we can take two questions at a time, and then uh, come back to you. May I borrow a pen, please? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, how are these cross-border shoppers regulated? Just they come and go? Do you want to take another one? And, or you have uh, in your lecture, you have covered mostly the, the shanty part of your, that uh, Johannesburg is dealing with. And whenever we find that uh, we are into some shanty towns, so we find there are a lot of NGOs working and then there are certain municipalities, rules and regulations they are taken care of as the advent of all these uh, hodgepodge is created. So you have not uh, put forth any of those NGOs working or municipalities <coughs> You have mentioned that at uh, a JP Center something that uh, it was uh, the Metropolitan Police has taken care of and removed those. So that is one instance, but the other instances need to be, uh, you know, put on so that we know uh, where the Johannesburg lies in the planning and, you know, uh, revitalizing itself because everything is integrating and disintegrating in its uh, everyday our movement, so that is more important. So thank you very much. Still, thank you. Okay, um, thank you for those questions. So cross-border shoppers come from 
surrounding countries from Zimbabwe, Mozambique, um, Zambia, etc., they would come on visitors' visas into the city. They come on buses, um, so, so that's, the, that's the regulation. The other regulation is that they would pay taxes as they, as they leave, and those taxes are substantial. The import taxes they would, they would pay going into their own countries. So this is what, what makes it worth their while, even though they're coming, say from Zambia, it takes 40 hours on the bus to come to, to Johannesburg, and, and that's expensive, and, and staying there is expensive. Um, but they buy goods relatively, really cheaply. Um, by the time they get back to Zambia, they have paid multiple times the amount of that good in taxes and in bribes, um, you know, both at, at roadblocks along the way or at the, at the border post. Um, so that sort of covers the, the legal regulation of, the, of, of, of cross-border shoppers. They come for short periods, um, not only because the city is unsafe, as I, as I mentioned, but also because this is fast fashion. People are trading in the, in the fashion market. And what was really interesting in our, in our research around that was we asked if people were, how they decided what goods to buy and whether they were coming to Johannesburg in order to buy what was available or whether they were coming with pre-orders. And at least half the people were shopping for, for pre-orders. And that for me was interesting because it sort of spoke against this, I suppose, the, the rhetoric that we put out, that it's about Chinese dumping in Africa, all of these goods. Um, you know, people, it was, it was a much more sophisticated enterprise than that. People were coming for specific items. Um, and also, if I could say something more about that, they were also saying, you know, also, what, what interests me is that people are using their cell phones so much. So if there's so much mobile, you know, connectivity, etc., is it really necessary to, to come to the city? Can't you just place those orders and send the goods, even if you can't do mail order, you know, there, there are buses and taxis coming up and down all the time. Um, and shoppers said to us, we come because we, we are the eyes and we are the hands of our customers. You must feel for quality. And, and that was interesting. And then if I could take it a bit further, um, I, I interviewed a, I mean, this is a sample of one, huh? but I interviewed a Mozambican shopper who said to me, I can't speak to you because I can't speak English. I've got no English. So I said, well, how do you come from Mozambique to Johannesburg to shop for other people and you cannot speak English, if, if that's the struggle? She said to me, I do not need English. All that I need are some numbers and my hands. And that was what was interesting for me is that the other reason to come physically was in fact because you didn't have the language. Mm. And you used hand gestures in order to make the sale. So that for me was sort of, you know, I think the use of the phone and the use of the body was really, it interests me. Um, your, the, the points that you raise, I think what you're talking to is, is what I think, was, you know, as we know in the policy space, the two, the two sides of policy, huh? development and law enforcement. And I guess in many municipalities, and I'm sure you find this, those are at odds with each other often. And, and where... A policeman explained this to us at a, at a recent seminar. He said, because we, we always say, you know, the city leads with law enforcement. It doesn't lead with development. So it leads with its police force, with its legal regulations, and it kind of goes in there hitting the poor and, and, and criminalizing the poor rather than going with its planning and its economic development and its housing strategies. And these arms of the city are always against each other, and that's why we say, you know, it speaks with forked tongue, that there's the policy that says one thing, but they're doing the other thing. And, and certainly that's been my, you know, what I've said in the last couple of years. But what is interesting is that the, the, the head of, the, uh, of JMPD in the inner city said, the problem is that your policy people in development are not thinking through the regulatory side. And if you don't take your, if you leave your policy at the level of, the sort of the normative level of what is, of, of what is good, and don't extend it right through to governance and management of space, then we are left to manage the space and all that we have are our regulations to, to act in. So, I mean, I think those, you know, that's, 
that's probably an important policy con consideration. Um, certainly, these buildings are stressed, are overcrowded, are fire hazards, and and it is you know that's that's not acceptable. So, also for us not to be romantic about these are innovative architectures and transformation of of modernist infrastructure in, in really creative ways, which is true. And I think there are architectures that we need to respond to in new ways because maybe those 1946 regulations don't fit anymore. But we've got to meet this thing halfway because there are huge rentals being collected in the space. And therefore, I think landlords need to be held accountable. The city's, the city's law enforcement in terms of its planning law enforcers are not necessarily in the space. There aren't building controls officials wandering through the space. The police and the metro police who are in that space are there for rent-seeking. They are there, <coughs> essentially, taking bribes, confiscating goods, either that they are you know, permitted to confiscate or beyond that, or harassing people for their illegal status or their semi-legal status. You know, there are all kinds of layers of illegality. And, and if the city were rather in there with a built environment presence, which would also be contested and be difficult, um, one could then start looking at how is it possible to create safe space within these? How do we deal with the fire hazards in the space? How do we create a platform that secures health and safety and beyond that, a platform for entrepreneurship? Sorry. Who controls the police in Johannesburg? Is it a municipality or state? There are two, there are two forces. There is a municipal police force whose role is to police bylaws, municipal bylaws, so essentially traffic, and then they've been given also a role in, um, in some pub, in public space management. So they can, they can police, in, the, in, in this kind of entrepreneurial space, they can police if people place goods on a sidewalk where they're not allowed to. They're not entitled to police inside buildings. Um, and then the state police have responsibility for you know, all manner of public safety. Uh, you mentioned uh, that the greatest threats uh, come from police officers. I was, um, this is, uh, I was wondering if it's as unidimensional as that. The reason I say this is uh, I'm drawing from my own insights that I get from my fieldwork in India's eastern borderlands. Um, whether uh, couldn't these police officers also be on occasion what uh, the feminist Judith uh, Butler very evocatively called uh, the petty sovereigns? who have enormous discretionary powers to decide whom to permit and whom to deny. Uh, so I was wondering if it is, and given the uh, you know, story that you narrated to us of this thriving, uh, you know, booming, and the, I, I completely agree with you that this is not, they are not, uh, you know, like uh, these processes of reconstructions are definitely not, um, uh, you know, marginal, even though they they uh, they operate in that liminal space, but they are fundamental to the center. They are at the cent virtually at the center of this reconstruction. Um, so I was wondering if it's far more layered than that. Thank you. not throughout because I was late, but uh, I have been to Johannesburg and uh, I saw the pictures and reminded me of my visit to Johannesburg. V very impressive. But uh, the underlying things which I think uh, should be explained to me and maybe perhaps to the other audience is that everything is fine in formal sector of trade is, uh, is flourishing and there are systems to control the intervention of the police or the municipal bodies. But what are the institutional and legal systems behind, behind the whole process of informal trade? Because in Delhi, we also copied some, some of the features of the legal systems of the informal sector of trade in Johannesburg. And second thing is that how you provide utilities to these street vendors, temporary shops, are these kind of uh, commercial establishments which are non-conforming or maybe illegal many a times? Okay. 
Um, I think, thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, that we, we do need to conceptualise this in more layered ways, um, that, that there is uh, police protection and protect, protectionism and protection rackets that in fact enable the trade to continue as much as it um, threatens, the, threatens the trade. Um, and so there are systems of collection for police who are then enabling trade in particular areas and are um, maybe, maybe favoring particular groups because of systems of patronage that, that have been arranged there, but also maybe keeping out other threats that may be even, even larger threats. So this police force keeping out a bigger police force or, or a force behind it. As I'm saying, or that that you know section of, of, of the police through that through that patronage. So obviously people are paying protection money for a certain kind of protection to to enable the trade to continue. Um, and so we we do need to to conceptualise it in, in more layered ways. And, and thank you for that, rather than that I've been useful in the reply. Um, the in, informal trade is is regulated in in several ways. There is an informal business act. In the in, in or a business a business act, um, and and that business act sort of de declares that in order to it's 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 a very permissive act in that it says that you need to limit which roads trading is not permitted on rather than the other way around. So that's been that's been um, a, a useful that, that that's that's sort of good. Good, good precedent. Um, however, there are the municipalities at their discretion. So Johannesburg City Council has has sort of has not drafted or, or not implemented its policy around informal trade. It's it's the, you know it's been in sort of draft stage and put out several policy positions, and it's not been firm. On exactly what that policy position is, and so the, there are lots of spaces of illegality within that, and there, there there's provision for street trade and provision for the creation of formal markets, either off street markets or what the city calls linear markets, and so there has been investment in those, and we have a number of linear markets in the city, which are. You know, very well provided with shelter and with some and with some services. That policy approach, and and then there's 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 management of that, which includes management by trade organisations and by the wider city improvement district, which is a collective of property owners in that in that area. Um, because the city hasn't, even after the court case, after Operation Clean Sweep in 2013, they were instructed again by the courts to develop a policy around informal trade, um, but they haven't, they haven't put out, you know, formalised that that policy. There's there's too much sort of falling between the cracks. So the city doesn't it doesn't uh, count how many traders there are and doesn't release those statistics, and therefore. It's always under catering, and you know when you under cater, and we learn this from India, you create um, an artificial scarcity, and that opens up the space for for corruption. So it's still sort of at, at odds with itself. And in fact, since 2013, and the Constitutional Court, which um, overruled the City of Johannesburg's decision to remove 6,000 street traders from the from the streets, um, the streets have, in a sense, been flooded by street traders because there is no proper policy policy framework. So we have acts and regulations um, and we have other local policies that that contradict those. Going from the question which uh, he has asked about the informal trading you know, the pavement developer or a street trader or a roadside vendor uh, in Europe and in Delhi, 
particularly about Delhi and in Europe. There is a market for limited hours every week in some of the localities mm -hmm. so that they take care of that uh, pavement traders. So he can go there to in his van and he can open a shop for some particular hours or maybe half day in that locality and he can sell his goods on a cheaper rate. So those are the, uh, you know, some sort of organizational ability has been done, uh, mostly in Europe also and in Delhi also we find there is no uh, payment uh, traders as he goes to the uh, nearby colonies and opens the shop on particular days. So he gets seven days for his, uh, you know, mobile shopping, something, trading. So do you have that much uh, of uh, uh, awareness in Johannesburg so that uh, these things can be uh, mitigated to some extent? So we do have, we, we have very few off-street markets. The one that I showed you, the Yobel market, that is an off-street market where trading happens inside, inside that space. Well, that one, that one operates sort of seven days a week, but it's in a but it's in a concentrated space. We don't have seasonal markets and periodic markets as you as you're describing, um, which which I think that that that's possibly reduce the burden on the on the street infrastructure. What would also reduce the the burden would be if we did create more linear markets. And it is possible in Johannesburg because of its street grid to close off a number of roads. You could either close them temporarily or you could close them permanently and create linear markets um, so that there would be concentrated trading spaces and you could then free up uh, portions of the, of the sidewalk. That is, that, is, that is possible. But as I say, until our economic development department puts out its policy, which, which it has developed a draft and has consulted, um, but then hasn't put out its final policy, you know, none, none of that is possible. So, you know, there's very limited, there's limited investment in that. I think if we would just begin to invest in those, in the infrastructure for those markets, and also to invest in infrastructure for existing spaces where trade is happening. You know, we're in an economy where there's an incredibly, it's an incredibly stressed economy with 27% unemployment and, you know, youth unemployment, you know, reaching numbers that are close to, to, to 50%. You know, in, in, that, in that context, there is an argument for all available public space should be considered for livelihood generation. You know, we, we have that versus the orderly city, the clean city, the regulated city. Um, we do have very limited public open space in our inner city, and we haven't carved enough public open space. Um, and we're not... When we, when we, in the inner city, in, in its, its revitalization at the moment, when we're thinking of, of revitalization of new investment, we're primarily thinking housing, not economic activity. When we're, when we're developing transport interchanges, we develop transport interchanges and not necessarily transport interchanges with big markets attached to them. Um, and certainly we'd need to, we do some of that, in, in, you know, there are some integrative models. But, but not sufficient. I, I had a question, Daniel. I mean, um, uh, on or related to organized action from the traders, uh, have you uh, have you managed to uh, understand any evolution in that? I Means is is. Is that, uh, in one sense, self-regulatory and uh, getting more self-regulatory, or yeah, how how does the market dealing itself shape up? Uh, means is there uh, do uh, what are the informal policies? Are, uh, did you manage to capture some of that? In your so research? the I mean, there's, there's 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 a range of it. Yeah. You know, at times informal traders informal informal traders are organised. And there are several um, informal trade associations in the in, in the inner city of Johannesburg, and some of them are organised on an area-based way. Some of them, some of them are organised with particular agendas, 
and some of those are exclusionary, like trade organisations that primarily service a migrant community or that primarily exclude a migrant community because there are multiple politics within these, these issues as, as well. And then trade organisations have become more organised, more sophisticated in their engagement um, around court cases. And there have been you know, several court cases in the last few years. And so both with the support of you know, human rights lawyers, NGOs, etc., they have, they have built that, um, that organisation. There's some parts of the inner city like in the Ethiopian quarter in Jeppe, which I showed you, the cross-border. So with that, you know, with that sort of a hybrid of formal and informal of small shops inside buildings, but it's not formal, um, where there isn't an organized, you know, a single organized voice. They certainly organized a voice at the time of the removals of street traders, but that was really opportunistic organization rather than that it's consistent. And a lot of, so then there are other ways, there are other, um, organizations that, are, that occur that might be ethnic based. So even within that one space, there might be organizations that represent a particular tribal, tribal group or ethnicity, um, you know, also in, in the space. They do have a, a voice within the city of Johannesburg um, in, in, its, in its deliberations because traders, traders have been, you know, vociferous in their in, in pressing for their rights in the city and so they you know they are um, consulted around policies it's been an hour no no oh. question for this no. okay. thank you then tanya thank you so thank much you. for coming by uh, it was very uh, interesting and I'm sure uh, everyone here, the ones who got their questions answered have left as you see. But it's been a busy day here too. So thanks Thank so you. much. Sandy. Thank you very much. Thank you.